So I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, asked to be part of this uh, innovative way of presenting. And it's, uh, it's really quite uh, interesting to see how we can get past our problems with COVID-19. I hope everybody who's listening to this is staying safe. But it's a great opportunity and I thank both CCMA and ECHO for allowing us to share knowledge this way. So I've been asked to talk about the ablation of treatment of varicose veins, both thermal and non-thermal, and my own work, what histology and immunohistochemistry has taught us about the mechanisms of action of the different ways we ablate veins. So just Briefly, some of you won't know who I am, many of you probably, so I own a thing called the Whiteley Clinic, which we set up in the UK as an intervenous specialist centre 20 years ago. I founded a thing called the College of Phlebology, and we run an international venous registry through that. I have over 120 peer-reviewed papers, have written some books, won some prizes, and we run some courses. Uh, and we have been doing that now for 20 years in all aspects of endovenous surgery. So why do we actually use endovenous techniques? Well, one of, the endo one of the problems we have, of course, is reflux. That's the major reason of the, uh, that we get varicose veins. There's obstruction and stasis as well, but predominantly it's reflux. And this is a very simplistic view. A lot of my textbooks are very simple to try and help people understand. And when we lose truncal venous valves, we can see how they come out to form varicose veins. And so what our whole understanding of venous ablation and treatment for the last 100 years has been to stop this reflux. So traditionally, people have done high venous tie, whether you close the fascia, as many people did, and strip it, or whether you don't. It doesn't really matter, because what we've shown is stripping doesn't really work. And as we've shown over here, as we published in the British Journal of Surgery in 2007, this is a great venous vein before stripping. One year afterwards, we're already starting to see regrowth of the lumens and this has got reflux in as we can see on the duplex ultrasound. Now for many years people wouldn't believe this happened but this is a duplex ultrasound showing strip tract revascularization. So these are new vessels that have grown in a tract that was stripped and proven to be stripped both by ultrasound at the time and also clinically by measuring the vein on the outside. And we've followed these patients up now for over eight years to show what can happen. And we see this happening with increasing regularity. Now, what the British, uh, British Journal of Surgery wouldn't let us publish, uh, but we published in the Advances book, uh, the Advances in Phlebology and Venus Surgery, Volume 1, is this, and this is the histology. The referees wouldn't allow this because, of course, arterial surgeons, as you know, have spent a very long time trying to grow veins for bypass. It turns out that veins grow very well if you don't want them to. So when you strip a great venous vein out, you get the what I've just shown you, which is the neovascular tissue and the strip trap revascularization. And when we biopsied that, we took an excision biopsy of one section. I took this to my histopathologist and he looked at this and said, well, actually, this is just normal vein. It's got normal endothelium here. It's got normal intima, normal media, normal adventitia. And he said, there is some scar tissue outside, but he said, this is just a normal vein. I think you missed it. So I asked him to check and I said, how can he have four different lumens? And that was the point that he realized that when you have this strip trap revascularization and it grows back, it actually grows back and looks for all the world like a normal vein. But of course, it has no valves. We've now shown that strip trap revascularization causes recurrence in up to 83% of people by eight years. And so stripping really now is something that we should be uh, moving well away from. And the randomized studies that suggest that it's still an option, I think, are probably flawed because of the people doing them. The results for the laser and the ablation techniques um, used in those are really quite poor. So why did we move over to endovenous techniques? First of all, we started doing endovenous techniques in 1999. And within two years, had realized that there was no neovascularization. We published this uh, in 2001. We've also published our 15-year results in 2009, uh, 2017 in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery. And we showed that there was absolutely no regrowth, no strip trap revascularization, and no neovascularization as long as you use pure ablation techniques. We've shown that the very few people who appear to have this thing called PARVA, and you will see there are papers saying 1% of people who have ablation techniques and no open surgery can get neovascular tissue, but it's actually that not, it is there originally before the process starts. And this is the, um, the PARVA tissue. 
This is why the endothermal techniques now have been approved in America, Europe and England as the first line treatments. So back in 2004, I published this in the Charing Cross book and I had this theory that a lot of people were still talking about endothelial damage, sticking the vein together, which is not correct because I couldn't work out if that was correct. Why doesn't sclerotherapy always work? Why do veins reopen? And also, why do some people get good results and some bad with thermal ablation? And I came up with this theory that you need transmural death. You need death of all the cells across the vein wall. And all of the evidence appears to show that was correct. So this is the model that we have now. And this is the what I've published in the uh, Legos uh, Treatment Revolution book. And this is on the left hand side, we have a normal great saphenous or small saphenous trunkal vein. If we ablate only the intima and the endothelium, we get intraluminal thrombus. And that looks on duplex like we've caused a closure of the vein. The trouble is one year, two years and three years later, we get recanalization. And you can see this in the number of series that show recanalization and reflux. If you treat veins properly, you should not get reopening at one year, two years and three years. This is the process if you have got that bad. If you have transmural death, even though you might transiently get a little bit of thrombus, you will end up with fibrosis and eventually involution. So one year after proper thermal ablation, no matter what technique you use, you should actually find no vein at all, not even a small scar. So when we started looking at this, obviously radiofrequency ablation was what everybody started talking about in 1999. And many people say this is microwave, but it definitely is not. There is not a microwave, it's a very small microwave signal from radio frequency devices, but it is not microwave. Micro, a radio frequency is an alternating electrical current, and medically that's between 300 kilohertz and 3 megahertz. But you need to have contact with the vein wall. So when we started in 1998, the original venous closure catheters came in a 5 French gauge or 8 French gauge, later becoming 6 French gauge for the smaller, and a small thermocouple, which turned out to be useless, which was on the inner aspect. This is what the catheter looked like when it was in the vein. The four electrodes behind the main electrode sitting here collapse into like a ring, and between the front electrode and the rear electrodes, you get the alternating current one way first, then the other way at radio frequency rates. And that's what causes ablation, because it causes heat within the vein wall. 2004, Ceylon produced a very similar bipolar device, once again heating the vein wall. And this is what you can see here, the ablation in just a porcine liver model. You can see how you've got a bit of charcoal and the ablation comes away from that. But the most important thing to remember with radiofrequency ablation is you do need contact and it is not radiation. Many people who perform radiofrequency use this uh, or a similar device. And they've got to understand this is not actually radiofrequency. What happens is radiofrequency heats up this filament but that filament is covered by PTFE, and so there is no electrical contact between the filament and the vein wall. As such, the radio frequency merely makes this hot, and you're just basically putting a hot poker into a vein, and it's a simple conduction after that. So that's not really radio frequency ablation, as the heat is generated in the end of the device. Monopolar radio frequency, however, this is a one that's true radio frequency, and once again, you use the capacitance of the body itself. So when the current goes in and out of the electrode from the body, you generate the heat in the vein wall. So what effect does this have biologically, which is the point of all of my research? Using a simple porcine liver model, we can measure how many millimeters or how many points one of a millimeter we get the spread at different powers and different pullbacks. And we've now been doing this for the last 12 years. If you have a low LED, in other words, you have a very low power or you pull it back far too fast, you get almost no ablation. And as you can suspect, that's going to lead to failures. Unfortunately, if you need to use a high LED, but you do that because you've just turned up the power, which seems to be the natural way, you just get carbonization and you get sticking of the device. And you will hear a lot of people talking, especially about the original RFITT device, that it didn't work very well because it just stuck. And I'll show you some of the histology in immunostatic chemistry as we go through to show why that works. 
Now, what we know is the vein wall is somewhere between half a millimetre and 0.7 of a millimetre thick. And so using the porcine liver model, we used an RFITT radio frequency catheter at the different LEDs you see above. And you'll notice that the four LEDs at the right hand side are all the same. But what differed is we started off using 18 and 20 watts, which was industry standard and actually in the IFU at the time. And slowly we realized that you can reduce the power, but just use a slower pullback. And this is all published if you want to see it. Um, this is a reference at the bottom. And to get transmural death, what you have to do is you have to get the spread of that power, in other words, spread of the ablation out over the thickness of the vein wall. Now, as you can see, if you use the high powers, it just sticks. We get to 20 watts at three seconds per centimeter. We did get enough ablation going out through the wall, but it just kept sticking. What we found is by reducing the power very low and using a 12 seconds per centimeter, or even a discontinuous pullback, we could force the power out further. So when we talk about power in ablation, we must also talk about the speed of pullback. Many of you might think, well, that's only in porcine liver, that's not in veins. So we took some ex vivo human GSV straight out of a patient. This was control over here. And we treated both of these sections. In fact, we treated five different sections, again, published over here if you want the reference. And what we did is we used 72 joules per centimeter, but one at eight watts with a fast pullback and one at six watts with a slow pullback. And what the histopathologists show is in the normal, the, sorry, in the same LEDs, but at high power, you only get damage to the internal part. In other words, you'll get thrombosis and recanalization because these cells are alive. Whereas this transmural death over here at the same LED will cause fibrosis. And I'll show you more proof about that later. We have also published our results of this showing that if we can get this and use these settings, we get 100% closure. This is uh, the theoretical side that I again published in the advances book. If we look at each of these lines, each of these lines is an LED. So for instance, if we take 60 here, you can have 60 watts at one second, or you can have 30 watts at two seconds, or you can have 20 watts at three seconds, etc. So that blue line all is 60 LED. So if you write a research paper or you write in the notes you've used 60 LED, 60 joules per centimeter, what have you actually used? It could be anywhere along those lines and so it's not reproducible. So we know there's a maximum power to prevent charcoal. We know there's a maximum pullback time because you don't want to be standing there all day to do a procedure. We know there's a minimum LED to have an effect and there's also a maximum LED that's too painful. And what it shows that when you have an LED, when you're quoting or writing in your notes what LED you used, it's not good enough to say just what total LED you had. You must either quote the power you used or the pullback to show that you were within this therapeutic range. And this is the same for all therapeutic uh, devices that produce energy. Of course, with laser, we have light amplification by the simulated emission of radiation. And this is this is true radiation, not ionizing, but it's electromagnetic radiation like microwave. With the, uh, the, with the lasers, however, because it's visible light going into the infrared and microwave lights, there are different absorption spectra that you all know. This is the ex vivo model that we've been using for the last uh, decade or so at the Whiteley Clinic and University of Surrey. And we've published this, again, the references at the bottom. We just take some ex vivo great saphenous vein, but this is the accessory great saphenous vein. In other words, a bit of saphenous vein that comes out as a dominant tributary outside of the fascia in some patients. It is a little bit smaller than the great sphenous vein, but it is the one that you can get easiest to actually use with patients uh, ethically allowing you to do so. And we tether it at both ends. We put it into a culture medium. We treat it with whatever device we're going to use and whatever pullback we're going to use. And then we can actually culture it to perform both histology, but also immunohistochemistry. I'll now go through some of these results with you. So if we use just normal MSB staining, MSB staining is blue for normal tissue and red for fibrosis. And what we can find with the 8 to 10 nanometer, not surprisingly, as there's no hemoglobin in this empty vein, there's very little effect at all at 60 joules per centimeter.
However, using exactly the same LED at the same wattage, which was 10 watts, we have very good fibrosis using 1470 because the chromophore, of course, is water. And this is what we would expect. And we are trying to publish at the moment some research showing that when we have patients head down and with tumescence, in fact, there's very little hemoglobin. So we think that this reflects what is actually happening in most patients. Moving to slightly more complex immunohistochemistry, I'll take a little bit of time showing you this. This is again the 810 nanometer versus 1470 nanometer. And this time we're using an antibody against alpha smooth muscle actin. So this shows us what we're actually doing. As you saw before, when we saw the normal histology, it's very hard to know what cells are alive and dead. We can start to look at this by looking at using smooth muscle actin. And in a normal vein, we have this lovely homogeneous smooth muscle. If we look at the 810 nanometer, and at 40 joules per centimeter, again, 10 watts, so 40 joules per centimeter, 10 watts, you can see quite a lot of disruption through the wall, and at 60 joules per centimeter, a lot of disruption. And this is why, even though we don't see much fibrosis, the 810 nanometer does still have an effect. However, it's nowhere near the effect of the 1470, where we get severe disruption, even at 40 joules per centimeter in a small vein, and more at 60 joules per centimeter. Now, trying to understand what that means biologically, we have to look at, are the cells alive or dead? Now, if a cell is completely dead, of course, it is necrosed and you'll get no reaction at all. However, if it is dying by a process called apoptosis, we will see the alpha C3, which is cleaved caspase C3, generated in the cells. When a cell exhibits caspase C3 cleaved, that cell is going to die 100%. And what we find is in the control, there's a little bit of caspase C3, and that's the trauma of taking the vein out to test it. However, in the 810 nanometers at 40 joules per centimeter, we have caspase C3 all the way through the wall. So we do know from this and the SMA, we do know that that vein is going to die, but it's actually taking quite a long time to do so. And also if it were bigger, if it were whole GSV, we might have areas of living tissue outside. When we look at the 60 joules per centimeter, there's no caspase C3 on the inner side because these cells are undergoing necrosis immediately, they're dead and the apoptosis is pushed to those cells on the borderlines out further. Of course, for the 1470, the vein is dead straight away, and so therefore we don't need to wait for uh, any apoptosis. If we then look at the radial tip versus the uh, jacket tip, which is very relevant when we come on to talk about microwave later, is we can see, again, if uh, the control, there's no sign of any fibrosis on the NSB stain. But on the MSB stain, we can see with the jacket tip over here, we are actually causing damage in one side of the vein, but not so much the other. But with the radial, we have a nice distribution over here, as we also do with the microwave, which again is a radial radiation. Again, we can see this with the immunohistochemistry, with the smooth muscle staining, once again, normal vein wall here, at 40 joules per centimeter, and at uh, 80 joules per centimeter here, we can see at 40 joules per centimeter, there's not much problem with the vein wall. But once we've raised the LED up to 80 joules per centimeter, we've almost gone straight through the wall here with an end firing laser. And this is where you can get your ecchymosis, as the Americans call it, or your bruising. And you can actually get blood coming out of this and causing intense pain. Not only that, but also the charcoal here. Pardon me. Over here with the radial firing laser, and we find the same with the microwave, you get a nice homogeneous cooking of the vein and destruction all the way through. And so we don't have these problems. Most of uh, this here is the al um, alpha P53. And this uh, P53 is a similar thing to Caspase C3. It can be reversed, but it gives a very nice result. So you can use this to, as a marker of apoptosis. Once again, forward firing laser. What we find is the forward firing has complete necrosis on the side that the tip was touching, but less effect on the opposite side. And we don't see this either in the radio firing fiber or the microwave, where you get a homogeneous transfer of energy all the way through the vein wall. Just to show, we also looked at radio frequency. Um, you get the same sort of effects here with radio frequency, depending how you do it. And once again, as long as you're getting over 80 joules per centimeter and good contact, which you always get in the laboratory, of course, you get good results.
So moving onwards, having discovered all of this about thermal ablation in the lasers and having gone through all the lasers we could get our hands on and the radio frequencies, we've now started looking and at endovenous microwave ablation. And we're very grateful to ECHO as they brought over a machine very early for us to try. And we spent about a year checking it first of all and have been using it now for over a year in our practice. And it's now become our main way of treating varicose veins. Um, what we find is in the optimization in the porcine liver, we get a very good uh, distribution. This is putting the catheter back in, having pulled it back already. So this, you don't get all this uh, heat all the way down the catheter. It's only at the end, but we've done this in sections on the way back. When we, before we touched any patients, we looked at 20 watts, 25, all the way up to 50 watts. And you'll see these watts are a lot higher than laser. And the reason is, is of course, is there's a lot of power loss along the antennae. So the actual amount of energy going into the vein is actually the same. It's just it records it higher at the machine end. The, we also looked at the duration per centimetre, including a double, uh, how many seconds, and I believe the other speakers will talk to how we do this in practice. But what we found is if you do all of these different wattages and all these different centimetre pullbacks, what we find is about 40 watts seems to be optimal not to get charcoal, and that stops you getting pain. Seven seconds per centimetre is what we've recommended with a double treatment. When we use the trollop technique for the um, for the perforators, we use two or four cycles, depending. Now, we've become very confident in this. And although we haven't done the randomized trial yet, it does appear to be and it's good as any laser radio frequency and our impression. I can't give you figures yet because we haven't done them, but certainly our patients tell us that the pain is minimal. And in fact, one of our national stars has had this done. I went in our national newspapers and said he went for a nine kilometer run the next day, which we don't recommend, but it's certainly possible. Just to finish off a little bit about um, sclera uh, different ablation techniques, as I put it in the title, just to show we don't only look at uh, um, thermal ablation, we tried to look at how sclerotherapy works using this thing called geomori, geomori, but again, we came back to the immunohistochemistry. And using this, we get these lovely sort of fluorescent antibodies. Uh, CD31 is in red, and this is the endothelium out here. The alpha actin is in green, and you can see these palisades, these different, um, these different uh, smooth muscle cells all the way through with the nucleuses in blue. And when you use 3% SDS, you get death of the cells. Look at this, you don't get 100% death of the endothelium or the people who talk about sticking the vein together, that's quite wrong. What you get is about a 50% reduction in endothelium and you get penetration of the sclerotherapy about 200 microns. Not enough for a great venous vein, but enough for neovascular tissue or small veins. And this is why sclerotherapy works in small veins with thin walls, but not thick veins. And that's why there's no real conflict. Nobody should be arguing about thermal ablation versus foam because they are used for different, or they should be used for different size veins or different thickness of walls. And when we looked at why that happened again, we looked at the ICAM-1, the inflammation, and also we looked at P53 uh, up here for the apoptosis. And again, you can see the differences, the damage only goes out to about 200 microns. Remember a great subvenous vein is about 500 to 600 microns. So this is the uh, similar uh, diagram that I showed you before, but this time for sclerotherapy and again published in the uh, Leg Ulcer Treatment Revolution book. If you have a thick walled vein and you're only killing the intima and the first 200 microns, you will get thrombus and recanalization. And not surprisingly, the big studies on foam sclerotherapy for great venous veins show sort of okay uh, results at six months and one year, but terrible results at three years. And this is the process why that happens. If on the other hand, you have a small vein with a thin wall, you get complete death of the, of the vein wall, not surprisingly from fibrosis and involution, and you get success. There are a couple of companies that make devices, the most famous of what is probably Clarivane, where you get a rotation. And although some people have said this damages the endothelium, what our research has actually shown is it actually damages the media as much as the endothelium. And this makes the vein wall from normal into like a Swiss cheese. And this allows the sclerotherapy to go into the vein wall. So your 200 microns starts deeper. And this is why Clarivane does work, because you can drive the, the uh, 
you can drive this sclerosin deeper. And our immunocytochemistry shows that you can actually get a better result deeper inside. However, it's still nowhere near as effective as good thermal ablation for big vein walls, um, especially if you have a floppy vein. We have looked at cyanacrylate glue, and this is the one thing that stands apart, is this seems to have only really an intimal and a um, endothelial effect, and the rest of the effect is a foreign body reaction. And so with this, we are more looking more at a biological than a physical way of closing veins. So, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, really the conclusion, I hope that's been useful, it's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour of 20 years of research, but for successful venous ablation, do not cut your vein. Don't expose the endothelium. Don't allow any neovascular tissue. You want transmural death of the vein wall, whatever technique you use. And if you use a radiation technique such as laser or preferably microwave, what you find is you actually don't need to be touching the vein wall, whereas with radio frequency you do. Using microwave, you get the burning remote, a bit further away from the antenna, and so you get a nice death through the vein wall itself, and you shouldn't get any thrombosis. Do remember, however, you do need the optimal power and also the optimal time of application. It's not good enough just to get the power right if you don't give that power the right time. Thank you very much.